tonight. Prevailing in the fight, New Hope builds as updated booster shots join the arsenal against COVID-19 and a rural health care renaissance. We're going to take you to the groundbreaking of a first of its kind educational facility with the potential to completely change the landscape of rural health care. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later on tonight, our special guest will be Nicole Carrot. She serves as Assistant Vice Chancellor for Health, Workforce, Education Relations at UNMC. Dr. Gold, thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot of ground to cover before we break ground. Where would you like to start tonight? Well, I think we should start, Christina, where we always do, given some of the updates on COVID. And of course, to provide some very useful information to our audience about the current CDC recommendations regarding the new booster vaccines. So let's start off and look at hospitalization rates across our nation on the first graphic. And as you can see, since last time we were together last week, the numbers have gone up a little bit. We're now at about 1.3 per 100,000 or just over 4,300 uh, COVID hospitalizations in the U.S., still led by Delaware, Missouri, North Carolina, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and Florida, both of which are about one and a half to two and a half times uh, the uh, hospitalization rate uh, that's average in the country. If you look at the trend since the early 2020, uh, you can see that the overall hospitalization uh, continues to rise. And indeed, when we break this down by age group, as we always do for you, you can see it's still in the 70-year age and older group that is rising most quickly. The 60 to 69 group is now rising, but even the under 60 group is starting to show an uptick in hospitalization. Indeed, since we last gathered over the last 14 days, Overall hospitalization at 4,300 is up 24 percent, 24 percent in a two-week period. So that's a very, very significant and frankly very concerning change. Now, granted, the numbers are much smaller than they were previously, but the significant rate of change is what has really attracted our attention widely across the United States. So we're still dealing predominantly with the uh, EG5 or the ARIS variant, which represents about 21, 22 percent, and the FL variant represents about another 14 or 15 percent. What I would point out to you what's not on this chart is this B2.86 variant that has been so concerning in Europe, uh, South America, uh, the uh, Indian subcontinent, uh, and in the Far East. So hopefully th this variant that we've been concerned about uh, will not breakthrough significantly, although we are detecting it in small quantities in the United States. It is such a genetic departure from the other variants that hopefully uh, it will burn out or burn through in other parts of the world. And again, just to remind uh, our audience uh, that this information comes from four parts of the country, uh, the Mid-Atlantic, the Great Lakes, the Southeast, and the Southwestern part uh, of our uh, nation. We always take a look at wastewater surveillance, and I would point out to you that of the 1,400, 1,400 sites that are reporting, the only group that are rising is in the very, very top bright red category. And so while we used to see a lot of dark blue and light blue across the map, and there are still some, uh, particularly in the central part uh, and in the uh, Canadian border, et cetera, but if you look at the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the Great Lakes region. If you look at my part of the country and the surrounding states, you look at the Southwest and, the, and even in uh, beginning now in the Pacific Northwest, you can see more amber, more orange, and unfortunately a lot more red, which is in the 80 to 100 uh, percent category uh, in the wastewater surveillance. If you look at our chart that tracks wastewater surveillance, again, uh, unfortunately, the red and the orange are now the predominant color, far more so than the blue and the gray, indicating that we're seeing continued growth in viral particles in wastewater widely across uh, the United States. Shifting to COVID mortality, other than the last week or two where the data is incomplete, you can see that the increasing hospitalization rate, particularly in those over 70, continues to have an impact and again is going uh, in the 
absolute wrong uh, direction. And uh, in this view, again, uh, we're at 0.2 per 100,000 deaths reported last week, or 669 deaths. Again, it is up uh, significantly more so in Mississippi, uh, Tennessee, Florida, South Carolina, and Oklahoma. Uh, again, very, very small numbers, but it is not the trend that we are looking for. And when we look at the overall death rates due to all viral pneumonias, including influenza, COVID, RSV, and others, uh, and this is through September 7th, you can see the red line is starting to significantly depart from the usual seasonal rate of, uh, of viral pneumonia-related deaths. Again, indicating that there are deaths that we're seeing uh, from COVID and probably uh, early now from influenza and a little bit of RSV uh, that are concerning and, again, uh, going in the completely uh, wrong uh, direction. Now, as you said in the open, uh, Christina, uh, there are new tools in the tool chest, and that are these new Pfizer and Moderna booster vaccines. And this is a set of recommendations that is right off the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website. And again, I uh, recommend that our audience go there if they're interested in their recommendations. They're very clear. The first is that everyone six years of age and older uh, should get one updated either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine booster to stay up to date. People that are 65 years of age and older might need a second dose, uh, and this should be determined by your healthcare professional, of either Pfizer or Moderna uh, to be up to date. The third point here is that people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised may need to get additional doses of either the Pfizer uh, or the Moderna vaccine. And again, you probably know who you are uh, if you're on some medications that weaken your immune system uh, or if you are a, an individual that's being treated for cancer. Children aged six months to five years, again, depending on whether they've seen any vaccine before, may need multiple doses of COVID not vaccine to be up to date, including at least one dose of the new vaccine that was just developed for the XBB subtypes. And then finally, as uh, any set of recommendations occurs, uh, the COVID uh, vaccine recommendations will be continually updated as needed. So again, six years of age and older, you need a booster. 65 and older, you may need two. It's immunocompromised, you may need two. For all of those categories, talk to your doc, your healthcare professional. Children, six months to five years, may need one or more doses, depending on what they've seen. Talk to your pediatrician. So with that, Christina, I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want to talk about a really serious issue facing rural America, which is what's happening to healthcare in our most rural farming and ranching communities. This is a subject we've addressed on this broadcast many times, but we have a wonderful subject content expert, Nicole Carrot, to join us in a few minutes. But I thought I would at least set the stage as to where things are going. First of all, uh, if you look at the graphic on the left, we are an aging nation. Uh, in the turquoise line, you see adults over 65 uh, going from 15.2% uh, up to 23.4%. Uh, At the same time, you see children under the age of 18 going from 22.8% down to 19% over this same time period predicted uh, between 2006 uh, and, uh, and the several decades ahead. So there is no question, and we all know this from any time you go to the grocery store or go to church or go to school or elsewhere. If you look at peer countries like Japan that have uh, 13 hospital beds per 1,000 population, and granted, they are an aging population as well. South Korea, Germany uh, has eight. Russia has 7.1. France, 5.9. And the U.S. and the U.K. are down at 2.9 and 2.5. Uh, that is a very, very serious decrease uh, in the number of hospital beds uh, in our nation. And those numbers, unfortunately, just continue uh, to fall. 
when we look at the hospitals in the United States and we compare urban hospitals versus rural hospitals, you can see in the time period between 1995 and about 2010, the urban hospitals went down but recovered a good deal and then over the last several years between 2012 and 2015 actually started to increase again. These are hospitals and hospital beds. But if you look at what's going on in rural America, you can see that even going back to 1990, there's been a slow but definite decline in the number of rural hospitals. And indeed, over the last five years, that decline, particularly precipitated by the pandemic, which is not on this chart, has gotten far more severe. And of course, we all know that in the rural setting, uh, that could be the only hospital. Now, one author wrote these words, and I thought it was kind of interesting because it compared uh, health care, rural hospitals, to fire departments, to police departments. And they wrote, and I quote, if you think about a fire department in your community, fire departments don't get paid only where there's a fire. We have fire departments that are available in case there is a fire, and there's a cost associated with doing that. Similarly, police departments don't only get paid when there's a crime, although there's, heaven knows enough of that. We pay police departments to have enough workforce available uh, to support our community. And I guess the point that this author is making uh, from this national organization is that maybe, just maybe, we ought to think about health care in rural America in a different way uh, than we're currently thinking about it. Now, were that not enough with the closure of hospitals? There was recently an article that was published that was titled 54 Hospitals Closing Departments or Ending Services. And this was 54 hospitals that closed or announced services since last February. So this is less than a year, and it was not even a complete summary. And the point that I want to try to make here is if you look at the yellow, and this is just the first uh, 12 or 13 uh, that were listed in their, uh, in their listings, University of Chicago, uh, Perry County, uh, Adirondack Health, et cetera, of the 54 services that were eliminated, 23 of them, almost half, were labor and delivery services, and almost exclusively in rural America. <clears throat> 12 out of the 54 were emergency rooms or urgent care services, and 7 out of the 54 were psychiatry and mental health services. So, you know, if you add all that up, labor and delivery, emergency and urgent care, uh, and, uh, and psych mental health, you're talking about 42 of the 54 closures were in one of these three areas. And so even if the hospital or the clinic in Wilkes Bar or wherever is on this list of 54 didn't close completely, <clears throat> you can see that these critical services, particularly in rural America, have been eliminated, which means that women are traveling huge amounts of distance for obstetrical care and for labor and delivery. Urgent care for farming and ranching accidents uh, has been impeded. And as we've talked about so much over and over and over again on this broadcast, is that mental health, behavioral health abnormalities, anxiety, stress, suicidal ideation, et cetera, is going to become harder and harder uh, to get care. And so this sets the stage for the conversation. And you know, one of the things that the audience asks me all the time is, so what? So I would say what our audience can do is about these issues, and we'll talk a lot with this uh, with Nicole Carrot in a few minutes, is, you know, just stay involved in your local and regional health care access. Understand the challenges and opportunity. Don't be afraid to ask your community and your elected officials the hard questions about what's happening to your access to health care. Know the local health care data <clears throat> and know the future needs, because if you're knowledgeable about how many hospital beds, how many clinics, what their hours are, et cetera, how to get behavioral health care, you can understand what the gaps are. Help the community to recruit and retain health care professionals and support staff. This is not about whether we have fancy buildings and whether the coffee's hot in the lobby of your hospital. This is about whether you have the doctors and nurses, pharmacists, dentists, and therapists to provide that care. 
advocate for what you need. Do it wisely, do it consistently, do it with great civility. And then, as I like to say, wash, rinse, and repeat, and do that often. And so with that, Christina, I turn it back to you, and I very much look forward to introducing our guest tonight, and of course, uh, to sharing some of this groundbreaking information in just a few minutes. Absolutely. Boy, that cartoon had an uncanny resemblance to you. Somebody's earning their paycheck on the UNMC team. Love that. And we should have had that a long time ago. We're going to pause for a quick break, but we want to invite you into this conversation. We're going to open up our phone lines on the other side of this break. And Nicole Carrot will join the conversation. This woman knows just about everything there is to know about rural health care and how we can improve it. You don't want to miss this conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome Nicole Carrot to the conversation. She's the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Health Workforce Education Relations at UNMC. Now, she also serves as Director of Rural Health Initiatives and helps rural communities recruit and more importantly, retain young health professionals. Her work is incredibly important to the future of rural medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Rural Health Matters. Nicole, how did you come to spend your professional career working with rural Americans? That's a really great question. Uh, I actually am a product of a very small rural community in Western Iowa. So born and raised on a farm um, outside of a town of about 200 people. So this is very personal uh, to me in terms of the work that I do every day and certainly impacts my family, neighbors, and friends. Um, but attended, uh, I was a first generation college student and attended a, a rural campus uh, here in Nebraska and had the opportunity to actually come to UNMC and earn a master's degree, and I'm a proud alum, um, but knew as a student at UNMC that this is where I wanted to spend my career. So between there and coming back, I've had the opportunity to run um, and lead a local health department in a rural community that provided public health and home health services uh, to populations, uh, again, in small rural communities and counties had the opportunity to do some community advocating, uh, community organizing and policy work across the state of Nebraska and the nation related to health issues. And when the opportunity arose for me to come back to UNMC and focus on health workforce, uh, that being uh, certainly in rural communities and beyond, I didn't hesitate to take that opportunity. And so I'm really proud to have been at UNMC now for almost eight years and working on a topic that truly matters to me. It's not just a job, it's, it's a passion. Yeah, in eight years, I mean, that, that goes to show that you like what you're doing. And I do wonder, though, begs the question, Dr. Gold, is this a position that is normal at universities across the country, or is this something that you had to create for Nicole? Well, we created this rural health <clears throat> outreach program uh, to try to meet the needs of our state. You know, one of the things I've learned as the chancellor here at the Med Center is as I've crisscrossed the state and gone across our 500 mile wide campus, is that the challenges in the delivery of rural health care are very significant and getting worse. Not only are the numbers serious, so for instance, there are 14 counties or so, Nicole can correct me if I'm wrong, that don't have a single primary care physician. There are about half the counties in the state that don't have a licensed uh, board certified OBGYN or a pediatrician. And those numbers are prominent and getting worse with an aging population. And one of the things a great land-grant university has to do is not only be responsible to support the agricultural and the ranching communities of our state, but to make sure that the ranchers, the farmers, and all of those community members are safe and healthy. It's one thing to take care of the trauma, which we do, but it's another whole responsibility to be sure that there's a workforce of the future. And that's where Nicole and I sort of joined forces. You know, she with her rural background, uh, who knows a lot about those needs and is passionate about it and spends most of her time, you know, out in rural communities helping to grow, to recruit and to retain talent uh, for the future. Wow. You know, I do wonder when it comes to thriving rural communities, is there something that they all have in common, Nicole? Well, there are some things that we see in common across those thriving rural communities. Often that's access to health care and education. 
Uh, we see investing in infrastructure, uh, community leadership, you know, growing our future leaders, investing in broadband and access, childcare. So I think the, the common component there in what we see in those rural communities is frankly an opportunity to look at that thriving community from a more holistic approach and not focusing on one sector or another, but really coming together with unique partnerships and innovative, innovative thinking about leveraging resources in a community to really build a place that uh, people want to remain in or can be recruited to. So that's really what we see in um, many of those thriving communities. And innovative thinking is what led to the new rural education building that we have a special episode of Rural Health Matters prepared to share with you. We're gonna talk more about that after the break as well. You can sit around and talk about getting things done, how it needs to happen, or you can actually make the move. UNMC has made the move. We're gonna show you exactly what they're doing right after this quick break. Stay with us, more Rural Health Matters next. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. We are going to take you to a special episode in just moments. Before we do though, I wanna kind of set the stage. Dr. Gold, Talk about how you were able to get this rural health education building, at least the groundbreaking part. <laughs> Talk about how you were able to get that accomplished. Well, the story actually goes back long before the day that we broke ground for this building. And that is about 10 years ago, we broke ground on the same Kearney site for a University of Nebraska Medical Center health training facility for allied health professions and nurses. And lo and behold, it was extremely successful, but there wasn't enough room to train physicians, dentists, social workers, pharmacists, and so many other types of specialists. And so we had a unique opportunity to partner with the state of Nebraska, the legislature, the governor, and of course, with the private philanthropic community who teamed up to provide the necessary funding, and I mean $95 million of necessary funding, to more than double the size of this facility so that we can now have a true interprofessional, interdisciplinary team of young women and young men studying side by side. And what we learned from our early experience, uh, which opened back in 2015, uh, was that 85% of the graduates stayed in rural Nebraska, a tremendous statistic. And so if we're gonna do something about providing that healthcare in rural communities, it's pretty simple find young women and young men who grow up in rural America, educate them in a rural site, make sure that they have their clinical experience in a rural site, get them a great job, and they'll stay, raise their families, and they'll become part of the health professions workforce. It's such a smart idea. Nicole, you played a big role in planning this facility, you did a lot of research in order to help you make informed decisions to make this a lasting effort. And you're going to have a chance to hear from Dr. Gold and Nicole as well, because we are going to take you to Kearney, Nebraska. We are going to show you the groundbreaking for this facility. And more importantly, we're gonna talk about the potential that it holds, not just for the next generation, for generations to come, for generations of rural Americans just like you. We'll be right back. Stay with us on the other side of this break, a very special edition of Rural Health Matters coming your way. This one you're going to like. We'll be right back.